Islam. Once again, this is your host, Caleb Gibson, bringing you another episode of The Road to Financial Freedom. The last episode presented wrapped up the four basic investment types described by Robert T. Kiyosaki. Hopefully, you were able to see yourself being successful with one of those investment categories and made the decision to either learn more information about how to invest in that category or decided to take a chance and enact the plan now and work out the kinks later. Either or, today's topic will be very beneficial to everyone because it affects us all. Today's episode is called Being Tax Conscious. And this is a very important episode because it deals generally with how to keep from getting upset by the IRS while learning ways to lessen the tax burden they impose. In reality, taxes are what our government used to repay the debts that it incurs by using the U.S. dollar in the first place. As I said many episodes ago, the U.S. dollar is practically a promissory note used to get what is desired at the expense of the indebtedness of the U.S. taxpayers. But to pay our debts, we simply use the same notes that obligate us to face this sort of debt which in the end causes inflation to rise. Taxes don't necessarily have to increase as our currency devalues, but they may increase in order to recalibrate the deficit. This may come in the form of increased tax rates on certain American people or the society as a whole. Yet, it could also come in the form of a special levy on taxation. At the end of the day, that's all dependent upon Congress's legislation, though. The regulatory entity in which Congress exercises its power of taxation through, after legislating, is called the Internal Revenue Service, or IRS for short. The IRS enforces the tax laws by regulating the people's accordance with the legislative legislation Congress passes in their own guidelines concerning revenue-related matters. Of course, your taxes are used for public matters such as education and transportation also, but one of the key points the government doesn't hesitate to overlook when informing the American citizens of what the country's state of affairs is, how it is, because of the use of our currency is severely indebting our people, causing inflation to increase rapidly, and ultimately leading to the reconfiguration of our monetary system without the U.S. citizens' consent. In order to counteract this movement toward a new and sketchily designed monetary system, we have one of three options to choose from. We as a people can progress with the times and become NST and digital currency savvy in an attempt to uh, understand the next generation of monetizing before it fully arrives and take the world by storm. The second option, though, is that we accumulate large amounts of truly valuable resources such as land, non-renewable resources, and livestock in order to be self-sufficient and always have the things that may never lose all of its value, no matter how we develop our monetary system. Or we could take the third option, which is utilizing the monetary system still in place in such a way that will argue so much well that we can safeguard ourselves from an economic collapse by developing innovation that will become invaluable, as many billionaires have done. An owner of Apple is an example of the third option. Just think about it. Even if the dollar, yen, pound, and euro all became worthless, don't you think the superior technology of an iPhone would still be in demand? Don't you think Amazon's mass distribution service will still have a market to transport commodities for, even if all of those currencies fail? Any other answer than a resounding yes is preposterous. The only difference would be that instead of accepting dollars, yen, pounds, and euros, Amazon and Apple would trade their products and services for whatever currency did have value. And people all over the world 
will gladly accommodate this big business mandate. However, in order to pursue any of these courses of action while retaining a comfortable lifestyle free of governmental impediment, you must stay in accord with the tax-related mandates, among other things. Truth be told, I'm not seeing CPA or an attorney, so they can probably be of greater use in delving into the intricacies of your tax obligations and strategies you could use to lessen the burden. However, I can give you at least one guiding principle in the pursuit of being taxed less. That guiding principle is replace all sources of income with passive income sources and then continue to accumulate passive income sources to mitigate the effect of inflation and crime toward financial freedom. As I said on episode one, earned income, which is derived from labor, is taxed the highest of all incomes. The second highest tax is portfolio income, which is generally derived from capital gains. And lastly, passive income or cash flow is the lowest tax income. Therefore, by simply replacing all of your non-passive income sources with passive income sources, you can be saving a lot of money and time since passive income comes with you not doing near as much work as earned income requires. From personal knowledge, I know that realty is possibly the best source of passive income too. And it's neither hard nor excessively time consuming once you either establish yourself or decide to be a fully passive investor. But instead of houses, think commercial real estate, multi-family homes, and rent. And if this sounds interesting, you can feel free to reach out to myself or another who specializes in these sorts of real estate. Unfortunately, due to certain circumstances, I won't be able to personally inform you at the moment on these issues, but in the near future, I will have a medium in which personal communication will be accessible to all who will be interested in endeavoring in multifamily and commercial real estate. As for the tax aspect of this ordeal, before committing to a venture, be fully aware of the tax implications. The IRS has a plethora of information on their tax-related guidelines at irs.gov. However, I advise consulting with a knowledgeable attorney and or accountant to see how these guidelines apply to you and your business before investing. For those of you who may be interested in starting a business, keep in mind that how you structure the business will affect how you're taxed. For example, a sole proprietorship's taxes are filed with the owner's personal income taxes if it were a job he worked rather than a business he operated. On the other hand, if you're considering owning a C-style corporation, you'll need to be aware and prepared for the expensive shareholder taxation that follows the taxation of the corporate entity itself. Of course, you can file as an S-corporation and get the flow-through taxation characteristic of a non-corporate business or an LLC, but then you'd still have to weigh the pros and cons of other things like the restrictions on S-corporations that prevent them from having foreign shareholders and limits them to 100 total shareholders, period. These are aspects you must take into consideration when deciding to open a business. Because of its flow-through taxation and lack of S-corporation related restrictions, an LLC generally seems to be the best structure. But there are peculiar aspects to everyone's situation that can make one's ideal business structure different from another's. Legal professionals can be key in helping you sort out which business structure is best for you, thanks to their expertise in a field that shows them firsthand what happens to people who jump in head first without understanding their tax obligations. With that, I'll bring the episode to a close. I want to thank all of you for tuning in to this episode and ask you to subscribe to the Prison Riot Radio YouTube channel so you can check out the next episode. And now, I'll leave as I can. In peace.